tell you what, if I can keep the order of things correct, we'll have scripture reading, uh, we'll have a special, I'll dismiss junior church, so help me remember how that goes, all right? And so uh, I don't want to uh, forget if I can help it. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, Deuteronomy chapter number 11, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter number 11. And don't worry, we're safe today. Uh, whether Brother Starr is able to make sure that that clock is is got a good battery in it, and things like that. Last week, I told you that uh, my watches were just stopping left and right. And Denny gave me his watch. I have it on this morning. And uh, I, and I thought about it. And it's like, boy, that was so kind. It really is. But there was an ulterior motive. He just didn't want me to go too far over inside. <laughs> but thank you, Denny. And uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 11, one interesting thing that God does for you and I is he provides, and I could just stop right there, he provides. He gives exactly what is necessary and what is needed for the day, for you, and he perfectly caters that to your need. Not only to your need, but also to how you can accept it and take it. Some folks, uh, if, if you used to go up to them and you say, hey, bud, and you, you know, crack them on the arm, and uh, all of a sudden they would, uh, they'd be offended by that. Oh, he doesn't like me. He hit me. But the whole case was, uh, it's like, no, he was trying to show that he appreciated and things like that. But for somebody else, if you go up, slug them on the arm, say, man, you're the ugliest thing I've ever seen today. And say, me, t I know it. We're just a group of ugly folk. And everything would go fine. But you see, God knows that everybody accepts things a little bit differently. And so when he knows that sometimes you and I need either some correction, some instruction, direction, whatever the case may be, he caters it so we are able to accept it. Because we're all put together uniquely. Every one of us are. That's, that, and that's another indicator that you and I are a never dying soul. Uh, we will live somewhere forever for eternity. That, what, that is what makes you unique. And God designed you like that because then he gets exactly what he would like to have too. I, I know that sometimes folks say, you know, I, well, I, I can't sing well. It doesn't matter. God needed somebody that sounded just like you. And uh, you say, well, I, sometimes I, I, I do things differently than somebody else. I know. God designed you like that because he needed somebody that would do it just like you. And I know we think, well, not everybody likes the way I do things. Look, I understand that too. But God does. Because he created you to, do, to be exactly. And I know that and that's part of the hard wiring that we're all put together in that manner. I, I, <laughs> now, I, I guarantee it, in couples counseling, you don't want to hear that. If I tell a wife, look. The, the man was just made like that. God made him like that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to. I understand. I understand. I understand. And if I try to tell the husband, look, your wife is just like that. You're not going to change anything. He says, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I understand. I understand. <laughs> but in that instance, God created us uniquely. And in the creating us uniquely, when it's time to give things to us, he knows not only exactly what you need, but also what you like. And in that process, he is able to provide those things for you. And we call them blessings. I don't know what you all want to call them. Sometimes they're just gifts, presents. Just that reminder that God knows who you are. He knows the circumstance, the predicament, or the mountaintop that you're on or in. And he loves you in spite of who we are and everything else that's going on. Those are those presents sometimes that he gives. And we want to look a little bit at those even this evening, or this, this morning if we could. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, we'll begin in verse number 18 and we'll read down through verse number 21 this morning. So if you found Deuteronomy chapter number 11, could we stand for the reading of God's word? We'll read these verses responsively. I'll read the first verse if you'll join me on the next and we'll read down through verse number 21 this morning. Beginning in verse number 18, the Bible says, Therefore... Shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes? And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. So I want to talk to you this morning on the presence of God, his presence that he gives. Father, I do ask that you'd please just help us today. Thank you again for all the things that you do provide, but Lord, thank you so much for who you are. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to recognize and to realize how important you are to us. We ask now for your help today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The song I'm going to try to sing this morning was uh, written in 1912 uh, by a man named C. Austin Miles. And it's interesting to look at some of the stories behind the songs we sing. Sometimes we just sing the words and that's about it. But I just thought, oh, I hope that's all right, just share just a little bit about the testimony of, of Mr. Miles as he, um, the story behind this song. Uh, he said uh, he was, uh, got his Bible out one day and, and he kind of fell open to John chapter 20, which he had read, read many times before. Uh, and he kind of felt himself transported in, into that scene uh, in the, the garden tomb uh, when Mary was there alone uh, as she knelt before her lo Lord and, and cried, Rabboni. And he thought about that. And he, he pictured in his mind, he saw uh, John and Peter come running to the tomb and Peter rushing in and John kind of looking in as well and, and seeing what they saw. And, uh, and then uh, as they departed, Mary reappeared in the scene, uh, leaning her head upon her arm at the tomb, maybe, and, and weeping, and, and turned around, and she saw, uh, not knowing who it was, saw Jesus standing there, uh, and uh, she uh, realized who it was once he spoke to her, and, and she looked into his face and, and again cried, Rabboni, or, or Master, and he said, uh, Mr. Miles said, I wakened in sunlight, gripping my Bible with my muscles tense and nerves vibrating under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, I wrote as quickly as the words could be formed, the lyrics exactly as it is sung today. That same evening, he said, I wrote the tune. It is sung today as it was written in 19, uh, 1912. Um, in the garden, this is a song that I remember my dad singing on many occasions. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the void we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is 
flesh calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever been in heaven now for a number of years. He may have sang that song, but now he gets to enjoy it. That's just a reminder of a beautiful thing of heaven. It just is. Oh! All those that are nine years old and below may be dismissed to junior church at this time. I thought, Lord, I've heard you speak, but not quite like that before, but... <laughs> All right, so as, as the junior church and the workers make their way out, I'll, let me draw your attention, if I may, once again, to Deuteronomy chapter number 11. I want you to notice in verse number 18, as the very first word is, therefore. Therefore shall we lay up these words in your heart and in your soul. The reason being is, in previous days, or in the previous uh, words that have been spoken, and uh, the things that have been stated already prior to what he is getting ready to state, he is reminding them of their ability to be able to choose to do what God had instructed them or choose not to do what they instructed him. By the way, uh, it is still the same choice that you and I have today. You have the ability to choose either between right and wrong. I think it's interesting because the Lord in another place in the book of Deuteronomy says that you have the choice of life or death. Sometimes I know that we're thinking, well, we're just making a choice today, but you're literally choosing a pathway that uh, will lead in a direction at some point. And uh, the, end, uh, the end of that, uh, for instance, uh, I can't help but think as uh, uh, Brother John and his brothers, of course, Brother Tim is here also, and uh, Miss Donna so graciously uh, has now uh, been without Brother Roy for a, a number of years since he's gone to heaven. I don't know everything that they knew immediately when they were making decisions about their family and things of that nature. Uh, of course, there's no way that they could know exactly uh, how many, uh, wh whether they would have boys or girls or things of that nature. And even as uh, Brother Caleb and Miss Grace are now are, are contemplating what uh, the Lord may pr give them, uh, I, I think it may be still a little early before they can determine that. I don't know. Uh, but it, at any rate, it doesn't matter in that manner. They're just thinking, I just want the little one to be healthy. I want them to be well. I want them to be able to uh, be what the Lord would want for us to have. And I do too. And I've prayed for them. And uh, we'll continue to do that. But in the process of that, little did they know that the decisions that they would make on that day would provide for them the wherewithal where all four of their children would be in the house of God somewhere on a Sunday. But the way that they did that is they said, you know what, I'm going to begin today to make provisions for that future tomorrow. Now, I can't guarantee everything that will happen, but what I can do is by playing the averages, say, I will do the most imperative today in hopes for what may be a blessing tomorrow. And God in the verses before this gave them that choice, said, you can choose to do what you'd like today. By the way, as I said, same choices that you and I have to make on a daily basis also. So uh, even as I was mentioning a little bit earlier this morning, uh, we all have that choice to make in a daily time. We, out of all the decisions that you make in the days, there's probably close to, probably close to 10,000 decisions that you make in some manner or another. You're going to leave the, the uh, well, at some time you're going to leave. You can stay as long as you want, uh, but uh, I'm going to go to lunch at some point or another. But uh, uh, when you leave the building, you have options. You could go out this door. You could go out that door. You could go out one of the other doors. And uh, chances are you could go out and get into your car and drive up. Now, you could go out and get in someone else's car. You could. And you may say, uh, you know, as the folks get in there, say, well, brother, sister, so-and-so, I've, I've 
you know, I love you, but what are you doing in my car? Well, I didn't like mine. I liked yours better, so I just thought I'd ride in it today. Uh, well, do you, do you need me to take you home? Nope, just want to ride. Uh, well, you've got a choice. That's why I lock my car so y'all don't get in there, so I'm not, I'm not taking you anywhere. But uh, in that instance, you have a choice to make. And all those choices that you make, you make knowing that you're wanting an end result with them. You're going to get in your car, hopefully start it, and make its way. As long as it doesn't start with a four-letter word, it'll probably start. If not, let us know. We'll give you a ride home. But uh, in that instance, uh, there may be the occasion where you're going to decide which direction you're going to go and so on and so forth. All of those come into play, but you make that decision because you have that ability to make that decision. Now, the ones that have a little bit more gravity to them, a little more serious, you make. uh, But uh, the wise person understands, yes, I have to make decisions that are going to change my life and are going to make a decision that may set a precedent that I've got to live with. So in that instance, I want to make sure that I use wisdom. I want to use instruction that I've been given. And I want to find out what's going to be the best benefit to me so that tomorrow I'll be pleased with the results or the consequences that come my way. So in that instance, you oftentimes will principle that decision to say, you know what, if I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm going to one, I'm going to pray about it, I'm going to seek counsel, and then when I make that decision, I'm going to live with what it is that comes my direction because I have followed a right principle to get to the best answer that I can get. Now, if you just throw caution to the wind and say, well, I'm just going to flip a coin and go after it. Now, you can do that if you choose. I'm not saying that's the best choice. Sometimes, you know, if you have the choice between McDonald's and Burger King flipping a coin, you're losing both ways, so it don't matter. So you know that. But in that instance, when you're making a decision that's going to be life-changing, where you're going to live, who you're going to marry, where you're going to work, what you're going to do with your life, those are big decisions that will hopefully last a long, long time, and they're going to do something that will either benefit you or be a detriment to you. So you try to make those with caution and uh, make them with some reality of, this is going to set a precedent in my life. Here the children of Israel, that word therefore is reminding them of everything else that has happened beforehand. May I direct your attention to verse number 13, because the Lord has already promised about the land Because let me read just one verse very quickly. It says in verse number 10, For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came from. So in other words, he is saying you're not going to be able to draw from the experience that you've had before. Because you don't know what it is. This is going to be new territory. You've never done this. So as we come to verse number 13, it says, And it shall come to pass if, there's that contingency, that choice. If ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that, notice, I will give you. So there's, you say, oh, well, man, I like it when God gives things because he is not a cheap giver. He does well. He's been giving for a long time when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's a treasure that we ought to, uh, we ought to set on the highest pinnacle that w- of decisions that we could ever make. And in that instance, he says, if you will do what I've asked you and keep my commandments and serve me, I will give you. So the choice there is a little bit along these lines here. You've been, you have the option. So he goes on to say in verse number 14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and latter rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, and I will send grass in thy fields so that the pastor can complain about mowing it so often. And so, No, that's not what it said. Verse 15, and I will send grass in thy field for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. He goes on to say, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. So we see here, there's an option. You have choices. But you see, God has promised presence for those that want to follow his will. Because in verse number 17, it goes on to say, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. Because as you begin to worship other gods and allow other things. And by the way, I think sometimes we understand very clearly the graven images things. I think sometimes we are a little bit deceived when it comes time for 
uh, idolatry because idolatry, let me give you a definition is for idolatry. It, it really is very simple. Following God and letting him be your God means that he is your source. That means you turn to him for everything that is done. I, scripture says, well, I, my job takes care of me. You only have that job because God gave you the power to do that job. It's, in, it's stated in Scripture. But at the time that you need a different job or you need something that's going to supply the need, you go to your source and say, God, I need your help. So when everything else falls apart and everything else goes to put, God still takes care of his own. And he can do that. And you go to him and he'll lead you in the pathway that he wants you to go. He is your source. Everything else that he provides is a resource. The job you have is a resource of your source. The health that you have is a resource of your source. And in that instance, you can foster and you can build and you can, and you can benefit from all of those things. But when it all boils down, if you begin to make one of your resources your source, that's idolatry. When you begin to look at just the resource that you have, the money in the bank that you have as, uh, as your source... No, that can, that can go in a heartbeat. It can disappear that fast. But God is never going to disappear. He's not going to go away. When you make him your source, you'll realize that uh, when it all boils down, all the other resources he can provide, he can, put a, he can put a table in the desert, he can supply needs like nobody else, he can make you have a job when no one else does. He can, and he will because he's able. But the choice is that you make him your source. Idolatry is when you make a resource your source. That's idolatry. And in that instance, God, in every single instance in Scripture, has allowed difficulties to come the direction of those that have made a resource their source. Because that's idolatry, and God always has made it very clear. The first two commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me, and thou shalt make no graven images. So in that instance, God has made it very clear when you make a resource your source, you're entering into idolatry and that's going to bring a difficulty your direction because that resource is not going to give you what you need. It, it, it will be very lame when it comes to that. It, may, it can supply some of the things that you need today, but when you allow God to be the, the source of all of the others, it will make all the difference in the world. So we see here in verse number 17 because he's saying literally this, when you allow your resource to become your source, then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shall shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. And he said the land's good, nothing wrong with the land. Nothing wrong with what it can do. Nothing wrong with how it can produce. But let me remind you of this, I'm the one that sustains it. Because then he comes in the very next verse and he says, therefore, he says, because of all the things that I've just stated, Therefore, ye shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign about your hand that thou mayest be, a, uh, be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, he says, remind yourself of them. Remind who is your source. That means the songs that you sing. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. And uh, one of our, our chorus of the month. And as you're, as you're working and as you're doing things, I, I mentioned in my Sunday school class this morning to the young adults that were there, and uh, as we were, uh, there was just this past week, there was somebody that was making a statement, and, uh, and I would not have thought they would make the statement. They were talking about making choices, because we were talking about that a little bit, and he overheard this, and, uh, and it came to play, he was talking about children that that, uh, that were oftentimes unwanted and, and things of that nature and, and not treated well and things. And he says, why in the world would people engage in the activity that's going to create a child? Now, he didn't phrase it that PG, all right? But, uh, and he said, instead of, you know, after the fact. And I looked at him, almost a little bit surprised, and I said, amen. <laughs> and he said, that's right. And uh, it's like, look. You know, even chuckleheads can make a good statement every now and then. Look, even a clock that don't run is right twice a day. And so uh, just keep in mind, you're not wrong all the time, all right? Husbands, that's your out, all right? So uh, in this instance, we see here that the Lord is reminding them, look, I've, I've told you how to live. I've told you what to do. And I've given you those things, so remind yourself of them. 
And so in that instance, as he is reminding us of how God's going to take care of things, let me just mention some things, if I can, if I can this morning. Three things, basically. The gift of God. The gift of God is mentioned oftentimes. And I want you to notice, if you would please, in, uh, in the verse that we did not read, but I want you to notice, if you would please, in verse number three, if you would. Verse number three. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verse number 3, And his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt, unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land, that what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to, to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord had destroyed uh, them unto this day, and what he did unto you in the wilderness until ye came unto this place. Basically, he is saying this. He is providing for the children of Israel. He said, one of the gifts that I have given to you is salvation. I have given you salvation. I have provided for you a deliverance from the difficulties that you have faced. The problems that you have are an element of what sin has created. I know that many times folks have said, well, where is God when all this is going? He's the same place he's always been. He's been sitting on the throne. It's sin that has caused that difficulty. God is not a God that removes all the problems. He is not a God that removes all the difficulties because sometimes those difficulties are what we need for instruction, direction, and understanding. Because the test is given to us to see if we've learned the lesson. Every last one of us, when we were in school, we hated test day. Truth is, it was the day that, <laughs> I don't feel good. And it wasn't the fact that you probably felt bad, but all of a sudden now you have to realize, I have to recall everything that I was supposed to be putting into my brain. And it's much easier to put other things in there, like what I like to eat, what I like to play, what I like to do. And, but uh, in that instance, it's like, uh, all those things, the dates, the history, the concept of math, and the equations, I, I, those are harder to hang on to. So now come Friday, I have to reproduce those things. Oh. You say, okay, well, all I need to do is put my notes on the pillow and I'll, I'll lie on them and just pray. The Lord will help them to, by osmosis, you learned that word, it, it will just ease into my brain and it will be stuck there. Uh, it don't work like that. God said that that's, that's not something to pray about. It's something to study. It was hilarious. I'm going to tell a little bit. As uh, Wesley was packing up for college, as, as you see, and you've seen this for, for well over a decade now, going on too, I write my messages and notes and things of that nature on these yellow legal pads, and I have them in the portfolio that is here. I, I've, done it for, I've done it for years. And, uh, and you've, you've seen me do that. Well, as he was packing up to go to Bible college and things of that nature, I took one or two of them and I threw them in the trunk. I don't know which ones they were. I just threw them in there. I knew there were just pages and pages of outlines and notes, pages of them. He was getting a poor grade because he was having a rough time outlining. And I'm thinking, if he only opened that trunk and cleared out some of the junk that is in there, and found those yellow notepads, I promise you, the teachers would be saying, I'm going to use that. It's at his disposal. It was there. All the thought, work, and everything else was put right there on the paper. All he had to do is literally, if he wanted to, tear it out and turn it in or put it in his writing. Maybe that's what he did and he couldn't read it. But uh, in that instance, all he had to do was just write it out. And sometimes you and I, we get frustrated because it's like, why am I doing so poorly? God stuck the yellow pad in your trunk. And all you need to do is clear out some of the junk and find it. Because he said right here, therefore shall ye lay up these my words. You must be reminded oftentimes of some of those things because God gave a gift. The gift of God is salvation and he has provided that. Remind yourself of that. Do you remember when you trusted Christ as Savior? If you never have, today is the day that is your opportunity. Jesus made it very clear that you don't have to wait. As uh, uh, Very clearly, the one question that was asked me one time, look, I was reared in church. I grew up. I was born the night we were having revival at my church. I kept mom from going. But uh, in that instance, uh, the occasion comes where I'd heard the gospel story many, many, many times. But it was not until February 23rd, 1981, still in church. Somebody had asked me the question. They ask me, Paul, do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? And, of course, it's like, look, I grew up in church. I know all these stories. I know them. But it hadn't sunk in just yet. It has to be my own personal understanding. 
And there has to, and same thing for you also. Very glibly, I asked him, I said, well, if it, because we all like that assurance of knowing something, knowing for a fact. If I was to ask you today, do you know that you have insurance? He said, well, I've, I've paid the premium. I've, uh, I've paid the premium, and in that instance, I have done what is necessary to have that insurance. And so because of that, I have insurance. But if I was to ask you, do you know you have it? You say, well, I have verification here on this little card. Well, you've done what is necessary to have the insurance. You now have that little card that says that it's, you've paid the premiums and you have it. But it's a little more difficult when it says, well, I have to operate by faith because I don't have something so tangible. So in that instance, as I ask the lady, I said, well, if you show me in the book where it says I can know that for sure, just like because she asked me, she said, do you know that you're going to heaven like you know what your name is? I said, no, I know what my name is. She says, well, do you have that same assurance? And in that instance, there was the occasion where I could say, no, I, 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 I'm not quite sure that I know it. That, I said, but if it says in, that, in your Bible where, where I can know that, I at least want to see it. Now, I was setting myself up, and she knew it. Because she turned over to 1 John where it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And in that instance, I said, it's in there. She says, yes, it is. I said, well, at least I want to see it. She took the time to went through Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 5.12, and uh, eventually to Romans 10.13. Uh, and in that instance, she went through the plan of salvation. She explained to me that everyone's a sinner. I was too. There was a price on sin. That price was death and hell. But Jesus paid that price for me when he died on the cross to pay for my sins. And all I have to do is, by faith, ask him to, re to forgive me of my sins and save me. And in that instance, that is what it takes. He has to make it simple. We call it simple plan of salvation. The reason being is God had to make it simple because it's for all mankind. And he had to make it simple for everybody. And in that instance, there comes a point where you have to make that same decision for yourself. Nobody can make it for you. And that evening, I didn't do anything, but I did go home and I went to sleep and... Uh, that night, I couldn't sleep, couldn't rest. I woke up in the middle of the night, went and woke my dad up, and, uh, and went in there and told him, I said, Dad, I need to know for sure that I'm, I'm saved. I said, I'm tired of struggling, thinking about it, not knowing for sure. He went through the same verses, and at that point, what made all the difference is now, not only did I know what was going on, not only did I realize what it was, but I knew for a fact that I was putting my trust. It wasn't anybody else. It wasn't what somebody told me. It's what I knew. And on that evening, as we were in there in the living room early in the morning, I remember what was there. I remember what the, the house looked like. I remember the colors of the furniture, the colors of the lamps, where things were. I remember Dad, what he was wearing, and all the rest of it. He made this statement to me. He said, son, he said, uh, now there may not be a great big change. And he was right. The outside wasn't going to change. I'd grown up in a Christian home. I knew how to behave. I knew how to dress. I knew how to act. I knew all of those things. The outside wasn't going to change a great deal. But the inside had changed enormously. Amen. I cannot describe from that day until this what a, what a tremendous blessing it is. And it gets sweeter as the days go by. You say, well, I've been saved for a long time. I can't say it without putting a smile on my face and, and moving me in a direction towards the Savior. Because I love salvation. Amen. Brother, brother, many times, Brother Andrew said, best thing going. You won't get a better deal. <laughs> there is nothing better. This earth could not provide anything better. Grace is the one thing that this old earth cannot provide. It comes from the Savior, and that's the only place it comes from. Not another resource can provide it for you, and grace is what you need for that salvation. For by grace are we saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can try all you want to be as good as you can to make it to heaven, but you will never get there. Not on your own. Jesus made it very clear in John chapter number 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he makes it very clear. A gift of God is salvation. Not only that, not only salvation, but he also gave another gift that was provided for you and I. And that's the gift of sanctification. I think it's kind of interesting because sanctification is that element where God begins to work through you and with you. 
because he begins to then <laughs> get you straightened up to use you for something that's greater than what you could possibly think or believe. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the New Testament. Turn to Galatians, if you would. Galatians chapter number 5 for just a moment. Galatians chapter number 5. If you can find Galatians chapter number 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and then the book of Galatians. Chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5, and I want you to notice, if you would please, when it comes to verse number 22. Because this gift is this. He begins to then work with you to make you a productive source. Those things that would seem unproductive, he puts together and makes them unique, productive. Something that would be a help, a blessing, and something that would, I, I know we look and say, well, I, we're broken people. God takes broken people and makes tremendous, <laughs> tremendous things out of them. He takes a broken heart and turns it into something that you and I could never possibly imagine. I think oftentimes of a broken heart that gave us the song and, and gave us a, a wonderful truth of uh, just Mr. Spafford as he was, uh, as he was considering all the loss as he was there in the, out of the country and his wife was, was coming and his children were coming and the boat that sank. And all of a sudden his children were lost. And as he was now beginning to sit down and realize, he began to jot down some words. And those words were a heartfelt thing that we sing about today. And in that we begin to, we begin to realize the joy that can come from a broken heart. We see that many times God has used an instant where difficulties were there and his will was brought forth by it. Over and over again, God has used things that you and I would never think could be used, and yet God does. He took a, a stick and used it to help part a Red Sea. He took a sling and helped defeat uh, a, an army against Israel. He took, as Shamgar did, uh, just a stick that was used to poke cattle and defeated 600 Philistines. In that instance, God takes things that sometimes you and I would discard and say it's, it's only used for one little thing, and God could turn it into something a whole lot more beneficial. Notice, if you would please, in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 22, and I hasten here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are of Christ have crucified the flesh which... Uh, the affections, uh, excuse me, the flesh with the afflictions and lush. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envy, and uh, envying one another. Now, notice as we back up just a little bit to verse number 22, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is. So he begins to tell us now how he begins to use us and make the adjustments for us for what is necessary to accomplish his will. Because every single thing that's done, he's going to clean up before he does it. And by the way, you're not going to break God's law and say, I'll get away with it and God will still use me. <laughs> no, you won't. Say, well, I'll do it my way. It won't come out quite like you expected. And in that instance, you'll find out that God sometimes is going to do things his own way. And his way is always going to be right. And your way and my way is always going to be problematic. But a gift of God is sanctification, that fruit of the Spirit that comes to make you and I lovely to a point and accepting to what should be done. In that instance, sometimes God has to work on cleaning us up. We have a, <laughs> we have a little cat that lives in our house. I call it the beast. And uh, in that instance, there is occasion where uh, her little food bowl gets uh, gets grungy we feed her that the the little soft food stuff and she'll eat most of it but there's always those little dregs that seem to stick to the plate now me hey you made the mess you're gonna have to live with it I'll just put the new food on top of it you know but then I think oh I wouldn't like that so this is what I'll do so I pick up the little plate and I wash it off till it's all clean and then I put it down there and then put the food on it and I'm thinking that's exactly what God sometimes has to do with us he has to take us and we've made a mess, and so he's got to clean us up. Now, what we want him to do sometimes is just to, God, just use me. He says, well, I, I want to, but now I've got to clean you up first just a little bit. And he has to take the, the mess that we've made, and he has to wash it off with the washing of the water of his word, as Scripture says. And he's got to clean us up and get us prepared 
so that we can be a help and a blessing. And God wants you and I to be a blessing. If we're going to be sanctified or used for his service, sometimes he's got to make those adjustments. For us, it is a present that comes because now we become more useful. The more we yield to him to begin to get cleaned up so that God can use us. In that instance, God comes and says, now I can use you greatly because of that. I know that sometimes we think, I don't like the cleaning process. I don't like the purging process. I don't like the removing of things. It bothers me. It, it's difficult. <laughs> Mrs. Whitworth was talking just about, how many have ever seen a, uh, she was talking about, you, you know what a tick is, right? All of us know what ticks are. If you've had animals that live outside, and especially if you had dogs, and uh, they get ticks on them once in a while. And you try to keep it because there can be other diseases and things that come along with it. But those ticks are, are there. I could tell you a story after story. But oftentimes, uh, my dog Smokey would get a, he'd get ticks on him. We wouldn't find him because he had real dark hair. And uh, until it looked like there was a piece of corn stuck to him. You know what I'm talking about. It's like the thing, and it's like, oh, look at that. It's got a tick. And you go to pull it. You can't just pull it off. And there's many times that you'd either get it hot and it would release and come out or, or something else along those lines. I had a friend. Bless his heart. We were at camp. And uh, I won't tell you his name. I, I love the guy. I really do. But he, he, bless his heart, he didn't get outside a great deal. And uh, he did. He just didn't want to get out into the woods a great deal. And so we, we went to camp one year, and we were out in the woods and things of that nature. And, uh, and that we all had gotten ticks on us because I remember one time I had to take a razor and dig one out of my foot. And, uh, and so we told him, we said, no, okay. It's not Brother Kevin, but his name was Kevin, all right? His name was Kevin. And uh, I, we told him, we said, Kevin, the only way that you're going to not get ticks is you're, you're just going to have to go and you're going to have to shave your whole body. And, uh, and I said, your, your head, your, everything. And he was a little bit older, and he's going, really? He, he was, Kevin's a good three or four years older than I am. And, uh, and so he'd gone to camp. He's like, really? And, of course, we're messing with him, and we thought, surely. But, uh, yeah, that's the only way you won't get ticks. And so later on that afternoon, we come there, and he calls out, and he says, Paul, come in here. I said, what do you want, Kevin? He had his shirt off, and he had his razor, and he's getting ready to shave his underarm. <laughs> and he goes, how do I do this? And I said, oh, Kevin, you don't have to shave this. He had already shaved one leg. And, uh, and, and I, I said, Kevin, you don't have to do that. And he said, What? <laughs> That will not prevent you from getting ticks, just so you know. You may be able to see them when they do show up, but it ain't going to stop them anyway. I shouldn't have told that. But uh, anyway, sometimes those things uh, get on us, and we don't recognize the fact that something has attached to us that needs to be cleaned off or straightened up until later on. And now it has begun to draw literally things from us. And we need help on getting them off because it's not just an easy removal. Now it takes a little time, effort, and it takes something to get them off. Because sometimes the dregs of sin, Satan will jump on you and he'll connect to you and he'll attach himself to you and say, hey, this is going to be a benefit to you and it's not going to be problematic. The problem is God has already said, my word has already given you instruction and if you're going to defy what I've given to you, accept the consequences when they come your way. I want to give you a sanctification. I want to clean you up. And the way I have to clean you up is by removing the things that are going to cause you to be unserviceable. And in that instance, God comes and he says, a gift is salvation, a gift is sanctification, and of course, lastly, it is a gift of God himself, his presence. And his very presence is a present that is given to us. Because all the things that come our way, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, are wonderful things, and we enjoy them, and we should be administers of those, but at the same point, there comes a point where it's like, Lord, I appreciate the, the friendship of friends, and I appreciate the, the graciousness that's given to me in other manners, but God, sometimes I just want to be around you. And in that instance, God says, that's exactly what I want to. I want your presence can I show you a verse that has made a major impact on me? Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn back to the book of Mark. Mark chapter number 3. I don't know if you mark in your Bible, if you put little notes in there, or if you uh, underline words, or, or, or whatever the case may be. But this is one of them. If you do mark in your Bible, this is worth marking. Because God will give us a gift of salvation. God will give us a gift of sanctification, but there comes a point where he gives a gift of himself. And he 
only gives that to those that will refuse to keep themselves from difficulties, problems, what he's already stated is being incorrect and wrong. And in that instance, he says, I want some folks to be close to me. He says, I'll take as many as want. He says, but I want you to understand something. And I want you to notice as Jesus now was getting ready to call the disciples to him. He was going to choose 12 at that particular time. And as he began to call them, notice in Mark chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 13, the Bible says, and he goeth up into a mountain. And he called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve. But notice the very first thing that he ordained them, that they should be with him. He said, the very first thing I want you to do, I just want you to spend time with me. He said, I don't want you to go do anything yet. I don't want you to go preach a message. I don't want you to do heal uh, the sick yet. He said, I don't want you to cast out devils just yet. He said, the very first thing I want you to do and the priority that you need to set is I need, I'll need. i send you to do all those things. He says, that's part of the sanctification. He says, I'll send you to be a blessing and a help and an encouragement and a motivation to you, your family, those around you. And that's a choice that you, you can make that choice. He says, but one of the very first things I want you to do is I want you to be with me. Amen. You see, God gives a gift of salvation. He provides it for anybody and everybody that wants it. There's a gift of sanctification that comes to those that would choose to do his will and say, God, I want to be your servant. I do. Whatever it is that you'd want me to do, whatever you would allow me to do, whatever it is that you will let me do, I'll do it. You see, David came to God one day and said, God, I will, I'll build you a house. And God said, no. Now, David could have said, what? I, I, Lord, I love you. I want to build you a house. And God again said, no, I'm not going to let you do it. He said, I'll let your son do it. Now, David could have said, well, fine. Well, if you won't let me do what I want to do, then just, well, just forget it, God. But, but David didn't do that because he said, okay, uh, can I gather the materials? And God said, yes. You've been a man of battle and war, David. I can't let you build my house. He says, I'll let your son Solomon do it. David said, well, I'll, build, I'll gather the materials. And David began to gather the materials until finally they had to say, that's too much. You've got to stop bringing it. It's more than what we can provide. And God, David was saying, but God means more to me. If I could give him the world, I'd do it. God doesn't need the world. He has it already. He just wants you. I wish you and I could probably get to a point where we realize a present is that very thing, his presence. And he has said, I want you to come boldly. And I want you to come. And in that instance, he allows you and I to do that very thing. But the presence of God, he gives salvation. He gives sanctification. And then, of course, he gives himself. He says, I could give you land, as he does. And he mentions it in Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verse number 14. He says, I could give you life and uh, make it productive and make your life a, a blessing. In verses 23 through 25, he says, I could bless you with liberty. All of those things I could give to you. I could give you the freedom. I could give you life productive days. I could give you lands, but all of those things are meaningless, he says, in comparison to me. Many people in scripture finally come to a point where they say, Lord, it's not just the blessing. It is you. It is the blesser that I want. God comes and says, I will offer you presents. He says, but the greatest present that I could ever give you is my presence. And in that instance, God comes and says, it's available to you today. You'll only know him by trusting him as Savior. You'll begin your journey with him through the sanctification. But you'll realize what a gracious God he is when you begin to come into his presence on a regular basis. There's no way to describe it. Human words can't. That's why when uh, John was called, uh, Paul was called to the third heaven, even John himself, he said, I saw things that were unlawful for me to other. He says, literally, I can't, there are not words to describe them. And in that instance, he makes it available to you and I today. He makes it available. He says, I'm here. I'm available. I will be your father. I'll be your savior. I'll be who it is that you need me to be. Because in the process of giving you all of these things, I'll cater them to your needs, cater them to what you want. He says, but the one thing that you will want the most will be me. If you'll surrender to those things today, do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? Have you surrendered to his will? I encourage you to say, Lord, I want to be in your presence. He'll provide clarity, 
that is unlike anything else, and it's available to you. All you need to do is follow the directions that he's given. Keep his word as he said. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I do ask that you please just help us today. I'd love to take a little more time, Lord, and just spending it on how important your, in, your word can impact us. And Father, I do ask that you'd please just bless now. We need your help. And of course, I do ask that you'd please just work. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, in just a second, we're going to stand. The question is this. When's the last time that you were able to draw close to the Savior and just spend time with him and it wasn't drudgery? And the truth is, as the hours passed, you begin to realize how I've, I've taken this much time and I don't miss it in the least bit. And as the songwriter put it, sweet hour of prayer, an hour seems just a few moments when you're taking time with him. So I, I just don't have that kind of time. You'll be surprised on how much you will set aside and how other things will wane in comparison when you're spending some time with him. But he's looking for somebody, someone, that will put aside all their other hopes, all their other ambitions, all their other desires, and say, God, I want you. And in that instance, he will allow you to then come close to him. It starts with salvation. He'll then begin to clean you up, and then he'll allow you to into his presence and stay there, stay close. But he's making it available to you today. In just a second, as I said, we'll stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Have you trusted Christ as Savior? Do you know for sure that your sins have been forgiven? I'd love to take a Bible and show you exactly what Scripture says about it. It's not joining this church. It is not getting baptized in the baptistry. It is trusting Christ as Savior. That's what it takes. And he makes it available for all mankind. It's available for you today. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. As the instruments begin to play, if God's spoken to our heart, your heart this morning, you may come.